All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight um, for our first um, PSTP webinar series um, as a part of APSA's larger interactive sessions of the 2023-2024 academic year. Um, we're really excited to have um, a series that focuses on PSTPs and research and residency this year. Um, and tonight we're starting off um, with what is sure to be one of our best um, sessions of the year with some current physician scientist training program or research and residency um, residents um, who are here to tell you about their experience, um, answer your questions about research and residency um, type um, programs. Um, I'm Carrie Jansen. I'm moderating. I'm an M4 MD PhD student at Emory University. Um, we'll have um, a volunteer from APSA, Jenny Jin, who's a G1 um, at Columbia, um, kind of running the back end of things. And we have Daniel and Kyle to of our APSA committee members, I'm um, also helping with the back end of things and, and live tweeting the event. Um, and so I wanna say thank you to all of our panelists for joining us tonight and um, spending time out of your very busy resident schedules to tell us about your life as a resident um, and just some wisdom kind of as you look back on your transition from um, being a student to being a resident and, and kind of any advice you have to share about um, about navigating that transition and starting residency. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started and, and start introductions and we can just kind of popcorn things around and, and we'll start with Bijan. Hey everybody, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am Bijan Tady. I'm a second year, of, I guess, PGY2 now, internal medicine and the research track here at University of Colorado. Um, going, uh, starting, uh, GI fellowship next year. So I'm fast tracking. Um, I was also at Emory and worked with Carrie kind of a lot um, uh, in the past on uh, some podcast projects and physician scientists uh, interest groups that we had there. And so I'm just really stoked to be here. I know this is a stressful and always anxiety provoking process. And I'm sure all of you are thinking that you're the one person who's not going to match well, um, but that is false and that is imposter syndrome and you will be fine. And there's a lot of physician scientist training programs looking for good applicants and um, strong people to fill those positions. And so uh, you're kind of a hot commodity. So I'm excited to talk a little bit about what we have here and what my experience was on the, on the application trail a couple years ago. You can popcorn over to um, Hannah Knuckleman. Hey guys, so glad to be here with you. Um, my name's Hannah. I am currently an intern at Stanford in their translational investigator program, which is their version of a PSTP. Um, my plan is to fast track into Hemong. Um, did my med school in Charleston, South Carolina. So I got to move all the way across the country. I'm uh, glad to be here and I'm happy to share anything about the experience. I just went through it. So it's very fresh. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, Mark, you can go next. Great. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Pepin. I'm currently second year at Brigham, uh, the categorical internal medicine. They do not have a PSTP, formally speaking. Uh, did my MD PhD at UAB in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, and then after that did a two year postdoc in Germany, uh, basically kind of <laughs> leaving the pipeline, so to speak, and uh, testing the waters outside of it. Um, anyway, I'm happy to answer questions uh, about kind of that decision to do a postdoc, uh, of course, Boston and uh, training here, my decision to come here. I also have four children and I'm married, um, so I'm happy to also talk about that from of a family perspective too. And uh, I will popcorn over to Hayden. Hey all, um, my name is Hayden. I'm uh, PGY1 at Yale and I'm planning on uh, fast tracking into infectious diseases. I did my MD PhD at UAB uh, with Mark as well. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to, to sharing um, you know, what we've learned along the way. Awesome. And last but certainly not least, Hannah Erickson. Hey, everyone. I'm the other Hannah. Um, I, I am a PGY2 at Massachusetts General Hospital in the physician scientist pathway. 
um, short tracking into GI. Um, so getting ready for interviews um, and happy to speak about kind of programs that either guarantee or don't guarantee a fellowship placement. Um, I did my uh, MD PhD at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign um, before coming here. Um, and yeah, I'm very happy to kind of talk everything about applications. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, as a reminder for our attendees, this session will be recorded. So if you step away or, or miss something that was said, um, we'll have a recording that'll be posted later on. Um, and please submit your questions to the Q&A box um, rather than the chat, which will give us the best chance to answer them either live or um, typed in the box as well. Um, all right, so with that, um, we can start um, with our first question. Um, and I guess it would be useful maybe to start with um, a couple of you kind of explaining generally how your PSTP or residency works, um, kind of a very 30,000 foot overview of the logistics since there's a lot of variation between different types of programs, like how is your time distributed and, and what did you think about when you're applying as far as the advantages or disadvantages of different styles of programs? Um, I'm happy to go first. Uh, so um, there are a lot of differences, right? We, we already touched on some um, aspects of that, which is the guaranteed versus the non-guaranteed. The, the PSTP, uh, like as an integrated part of the training, or, you know, you still have, I think at Brigham, the ability to fast track, but you're not necessarily guaranteed a fellowship. Um, and I think that's the same at MGH to my understanding. Um, I looked at mostly places where I knew I could have a fellowship kind of spot guaranteed because I moved with my wife and like she would have left me if we had to move again. And so, um, so I think that was very important to me. And then looking at what the program has to offer as far as like, um, uh, like, do they support you fast tracking? Because sometimes there's a little animosity between the um, uh, like residency programs and the PSTP because the residency program needs you as labor. And so making sure that relationship is okay was important for me. Um, and uh, ultimately I ended up here at University of Colorado where residency or fellowships guaranteed uh, they don't even make you apply. They just give you a letter uh, in this summer that says, you know, we are going to take you as our fellow next year. Um, that was helpful. And the other thing that I looked at, which I think UNC had some of these, um, was guaranteed kind of funding when you're transitioning to junior faculty. And I think UNC gives something like 100000 uh, Colorado will give 100000 for the first three years of your faculty position to help fill in the gap of your salary between your, um, uh, you know, what you should be making as a physician and what you're actually making for the hospital. And so I think those were things that I really looked at. And um, I'm glad I ended up here. But that to say, I think, for by and large, most PSTPs are relatively young and outside of like Vanderbilt, um, which has a really well-established program. And so a lot of these things are still in flux was my experience when I was interviewing, uh, which is bad news because you don't necessarily know what you're getting yourself into, but good news because uh, usually they're pretty adaptable to whatever it is you want to do in training. Yeah, I can, sorry, also try them in as well, um, unless anyone wants to come in with me. Um, but yeah, I agree with everything uh, that Bijan said. Uh, I will just say that um, the application itself uh, is very revealing. Uh, so you'll be learning a lot about the differences uh, of each of the programs, the strengths, the weaknesses, things you like and don't like about each of them. Um, I found that when it was time to make a decision, it was actually really hard because uh, there are a lot of great options and that's a great problem to have, right? That you have more than one option that you're really excited about. Um, you will have to decide uh, how to rank each of the programs. For me, I'll just say a different perspective kind of as a counterpoint that to me, when I started applying, I realized that as physician scientists, uh, we're a very hot commodity. We're very in short supply. Uh, and so I realized that the 
for me, the guaranteed match meant a whole lot less uh, at the end of interviewing than it did at the very beginning. And that was sort of me realizing that the kind of this enticing factor of having a guarantee wasn't really needed for me. And I'm, I'd be okay moving if needed, but uh, most of the time that's really not even needed for even programs like in the Boston or uh, in the Bay Area, very competitive places. Uh, they try to keep the people that they've trained because they kind of know what they're getting essentially. Um, so I'll just kind of say that one thing. Uh, the thing that really mattered to me a lot, and it's actually funny, I, I did a post-match survey and it's currently in preprint, so I can share the link to that. Uh, but as a result of that, I was trying to summarize, like, what are the values and the perceptions of people applying into PSTPs? Um, what did they find difficult or kind of uh, have a hard time teasing apart in interviews? Um, but one of the things that I learned from that is that I wasn't alone in uh, the fact that top priority for me was finding a community of people who were like me. Uh, physician scientists, kind of a critical mass of people at that institution that I could really um, share the experience with, um, in addition to the mentoring and all of the formal things that we come with. But I'll just kind of say that one thing that um, think about the people that you're going to spend time with, um, your co-residents, um, the people immediately above you, uh, because they're going to be what primarily determines uh, how successful you are. Um, and I'll just, I'll add a little bit. Um, I also didn't uh, necessarily distinguish, or I, I made note of programs that didn't guarantee a fellowship spot. Um, but like Mark said, I figured um, a lot of those programs, like the Boston schools in particular, um, there's a lot of schools in Boston. There's a lot of schools in that, uh, in the Harvard system also outside of it. Um, and so I felt fairly reassured that I'd be able to match um, a fellowship uh, without having to uproot entirely if that was something I was after. Um, but when it came to, to picking a program, a lot of what I looked for were um, not even necessarily research because I ended up choosing a place that didn't align uh, perfectly with my uh, what I did during my PhD, but rather um, a place that that has a lot of institutional support and track record of training physician scientists. And I know you hear that a lot, but um, I, I do think that's probably one of the major distinguishing features um, and financial support. That's great. Um, I think another question kind of related to structure and 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 thinking about what to think about as you're going through the application um, season. Um, how did you guys approach kind of identifying the research strengths of the various institutions and potential labs that you might work with in your time there? Um, and and then once you've gone to your residency and, and maybe as you're thinking about labs to join, for those of you that aren't planning to maybe relocate in between um, residency and fellowship, um, how did you go about choosing a lab? Um, seems like the process is probably a little different than what most of us went through in grad school. So um, yeah, basically the question is, how did you guys think about research strengths um, and what was best for you at the different institutions and balancing that with clinical training. And then once you're there, um, how are you picking a mentor? Yeah, I guess I can start um, a little bit. So um, as a background, I'm very interested in like liver disease. So I kind of narrowed things down based on like the very specific subspecialty within the, the subspecialty that I was hoping to go into to make sure that it was a place that did have one a strength clinically in that with liver transplant programs. Um, so using the ACGME's like list of all those programs helped me kind of find those centers. And then also looking at kind of places that are well supported by the NIH with like program grants or things. Um, there's like dedicated digestive disease research centers. And some of those are for me more liver specific. So that narrowed me down to, to a few programs that way. Um, and then kind of hoping for a physician scientist mentor, at least as a starting point to think about who's affiliated with the program. Um, as long as they have good updated websites that can kind of help. Um, <laughs> Often not, but um, that was kind of a starting point. And then going a little bit more broadly out or looking at sort of basic scientists in the area um, as well, and really didn't apply to a place if I couldn't find two or three people that could be possible mentors, um, just to not waste my time on other places. With the understanding that even if you end up at a place where you're guaranteed fellowship and you think this is the person that you want to work with, they may leave 
or something may happen. So, so that's why it's important to have multiple on board as well. I'll jump in as well and um, agree and echo with what the other Hannah said. Um, I think in terms of like finding where to apply, thinking about your research interests, th I thought about my research interests being in adoptive T cell therapy. And um, I could kind of narrow down the institutions already based on what I knew from PhD and those that were really interested in this had, had sort of been pioneers in this field. And then those that were investing for the next phase. Cause when you think about a PSTP, that's like six years and you're thinking about faculty, um, you could potentially be at the same institution for quite a while. And so you wanna make sure whatever you're interested in, the institution you go to is also interested in, um, knowing that you would have the chance to leave as well. Um, I would say many of the places I interviewed at asked who I might be interested in working with and they sort of, so that required a lot of reading ahead and uh, research on the forefront before the interview, figuring out who at that institution had um, publications that aligned with like what I would be interested in. And so that made the interview very productive where I could sort of already get to meet people in the field I was interested in and see what the institution was committed to related uh, to the research. Great. Um, I think we've talked kind of a lot about the theoretical of the application process, um, but I know um, with the variation that we've talked about in terms of the different types of paths within research and residency, um, there's a lot of variation. So can you kind of talk about what your application was process, process looked like and how that differed from maybe your friends that were applying um, to only categorical programs um, and what kind of additional things you need to keep track of that are above and beyond um, the classic ERAS things. Um, I think one of the things that really caught me off guard when I was applying um, was the literal, I guess, um, kind of like an MSTP, uh, if anybody, if the folks in the audience uh, are uh, applied to those, there's usually two uh, days of interviewing. Um, the first of which is with the residency program, uh, or perhaps the second, and the other day is with uh, the fellowship program. Um, it actually, I guess it's useful at this point to also sort of define some of the words that keep coming up, which include the fast track, the ABIM research pathway, and a PSTP. Um, and so, sorry, I'm going to digress just briefly and uh, say, um, so and really what all of these things have in common is the ABIM research pathway, which is a credentialing mechanism by which you can shorten residency by a year um, and then have protected research time during fellowship. And so uh, the PSTP is uh, like an MSTP in that it's a community that supports um, that uses that pathway to sort of train you uh, efficiently and, and give you an environment to work within. And so um, sort of circling back, you actually, a lot of these programs don't even necessarily meet uh, or spend a lot of time with the PSTP director or um, the program per se, and it's uh, frequently more fellowship focused. And so that, that surprised me. And um, a lot of the preparation uh, that went into many of these programs was actually geared toward learning about uh, the way that their fellowship program is distinct from other programs. Um, and so I think that that uh, was definitely different than somebody just applying categorically. Yeah, so I'll just maybe add just a little bit to that. And I agree with everything that Aiden just said. A um, couple of things in addition to that is the timeline. Uh, I can't remember if you mentioned this, but it takes a little bit longer to get the interview invitations. Uh, and part of what our survey was able to show is that um, one of the most stressful periods of time is waiting for your first interview. At least that was for me, and I think many of uh, the people here would probably agree that um, you have to wait longer than your kind of non-physician scientist uh, categorical IM peers. Uh, because there's a lot more factors to consider. There's a lot more people that have to sign off on you getting into interview, including a fellowship program. Uh, and so you're going to wait a little bit longer, like a week or two longer, I think was pretty average. 
Uh, but up to a month after submitting the application, you're still getting these invitations to interview. So that's just something to expect. Uh, not sure it makes it any less stressful for you, <laughs> to be honest, to know that. Uh, but also know that you're not alone, uh, that that's just going to be how it is uh, for each of you. Um, but yeah, I think um, one difference as well is that at least when talking with people and with interviewing with a couple of uh, non-PSTP programs, the interviews at PSTPs are far less formal, at least from what I was able to see. It felt a whole lot more like a recruitment session than an actual interview where they were basically saying, what can I tell you to convince you to come here? You know, like, what can I give you to sort of inform your decision uh, when you're ranking our program? Uh, so that was sort of the perception that I had in almost all of the programs uh, that were PSTPs. Awesome. Um, a great question raised in the chat. What kind of research do you guys see being performed in your programs? Um, is it basic, translational, clinical, a mix of things? Um, and I think a related question, uh, maybe more for Bajan, just because I know that you think about this, but anyone can chime in. Um, can you speak about if there's any pathways for MD or like MD, MPH students to kind of enter the physician scientist pathway at either at this point or some sort of related point in your training? Um, I, absolutely to that question. Um, the, I like harp on this a lot and it's, it is frustrating to me because we need more physician scientists, like as a infrastructure that is supposed to produce scientific knowledge and translate that into clinical care, like physician scientists, this is my opinion. But if you look at like who has won Nobel Prizes in the last, you know, since Nobel Prizes began, uh, I think physician scientists are an important component. They're not the only component, right? But they're an important component. And I would never disparage my MD call or like my co clinical colleagues or my basic science colleagues. But I think there's a, a critical role for what we do and for what the people on this call do. And that role it should not be relegated to those of us that have MD PhDs. And I think people across the country, like in administration are starting to understand this, that we do not train enough MD PhDs every year or retain enough MD PhDs every year in the physician scientist pathway to fill that need. This is thinking of it almost like an, as an administrative level and not necessarily like what your hopes and dreams are, but I, First of all, I think we absolutely, if you are an MD, MPH, I saw someone wrote in the um, uh, one of the questions, or you have an MD and haven't really done a lot of research, but think this might be your jam, I would say you should apply because the number one thing that I think physician scientist training programs in my experience are looking for, yes, they want publications and um, uh and letters of rec, et cetera. But I think really what's going to keep what what they're looking for that's going to keep people in the pipeline is enthusiasm. Um, and so I don't think that should be a deterrent. I think you are probably at a slightly disadvantage just because you haven't had as much time to do research. Um, and so that's my soapbox on, soapbox on getting away from MD PhDs being the only source of physician scientists in this country. But uh, to kind of address the point otherwise, if the physician scientist training pathway is not like doesn't work out in this initial application phase, but you're interested in being a physician scientist, I will say uh, I know a lot of these folks here at University of Colorado who came into residency in their first year, second year, did a little bit of research and really got interested in it. And there's a lot of these programs around the country, the STAR programs, research and residency that you can join and be part of uh, basically a grant funded mechanism to train you as a physician scientist before you go to fellowship or, or you know, go out into clinical practice. Um, so I would look for programs that have that too. I will say, I don't know how this is everywhere, but here at University of Colorado, we um, invite all of those, all the physician scientists from whatever background into our physician scientist training program events. And so they are part of the broader PSTP like physician scientist community. 
uh, which I think gets back to something Mark said that was super important, which is community is like the number one thing. If you want to find a place that's going to support you and support you as a human being and as a physician scientist, you have to you have to like that community and to be able to be supported by that community. Um, I've seen it here that the the clinical community, the research community, uh, the basic science community, and all of those people in that spectrum get along and talk a lot. And so I think that is very important. Um, so to summarize all that, yes, there's pathways to, to get involved. I would encourage anyone who's listening who has a little bit of research but is jazzed on research and wants to be a physician scientist to apply. Um, and because of that, like we need you. I find it funny that nowadays it's only MD, PhDs that are physician scientists. But if you look back at the data, it used to be, it's mostly MDs. The shrinking pipeline is because we're losing MD only. So totally echo everything that you said about, you know, maintaining that. Um, maybe there's other pathways as well, but certainly even within our physician scientist pathway, we have several people who are, did not do a PhD, but, you know, did enough research to kind of fit within that and even just our program, some programs overall, you know, just recruit in more people who are similar to that, who no, don't necessarily end up participating. Um, and that's another important thing is that um, yeah, this policy that you can do the fast track if you want to get done in two years and move on and you don't have to be part of a formal like physician scientist program in order to to be able to fast track um, as well. So it's just a little bit easier. And then you again, have that community when you do pick one um, that that is fit within that. So I think kind of looking to see if, you know, maybe uh, have come through might give you more, you know, confidence that they would be open to to another person coming through. But I certainly wouldn't think that that's necessarily a disadvantage. They're going to be looking at you as an entire person, your CV, and a degree doesn't necessarily summarize all of that about who you are. Um, so I think, and I think that was part of the question of like, what kind of research are people doing um, as well? Um, certainly within the people that I'm aware of, like, during residency, it's help. You can't do wet lab. Like, good luck. Um, I got to hold a pipette for like two hours this year, and that was like the best day of my life. So, or at least the best day of last year. Um, but you know, there's there's other some folks are kind of during like the residency years trying to do some clinical sort of things and try to see where along the spectrum of basic science into translational into clinical medicine they're really fitting. Um, it's certainly a time for a little bit of exploration before you fully commit to like the the research lab that you would want to work with. Um, I have a friend that was basic science PhD who's thinking about going into policy now. There's certainly opportunities to kind of shift gears and continue in on that you know discovery pathway in, in different different routes too. That's awesome. Uh, maybe to get a little bit away from the application process for a second, um, can any of you speak a little bit kind of just about a day in the life of being a PSTP resident? I'm sure it varies depending on kind of what um, your what kind of rotation you're on at any given point. But um, how is the lifestyle? Do you have uh, much flexibility in terms of kind of how your year gets scheduled out? And in especially for those of you in combined programs, you know, do you have any flexibility for kind of setting up your next steps as you transition into fellowship and into research. Um, and yeah, just what's life like as a PSTP resident? Um, I can answer specifically about our program, which is I, I find it refreshing in some ways that we're exactly the same uh, when we're interns and uh, residents. Um, there's some programs that cram pack your second year uh, in residency full of additional high intensity and patient uh, stuff. And so consider that as a factor. Um, uh, but at least at the program that I'm at, um, you're just a normal person, which means that you don't really get much flexibility. Um, and in fact, it's a pro and a con, you know, we get a schedule with every single day off that we're going to have for the next year. Um, and so it's uh, um, take it as it is. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, I'll just add to that. I mean, we're basically the same as everyone around us. I mean, the first two years you're in residency and it's been very explicit messaging from people at the Brigham and the leadership stage of the science and residency track, which is what I'm a part of here, that no research is really expected from you at this stage. Uh, and frankly, I've, I heard that from every other program that I was interviewing at for PSDPs. It'd say like, listen, your goal during the first part, the clinical part of your training is to be a good clinician because that's all you get. And you get a little bit less than everyone else. And so that has to be enough. Uh, to make you not a liability when you're seeing patients in the hospital or outside of the hospital. Uh, and so I just encourage all of you to take that seriously, uh, that take this clinical part of your training very seriously because that's all you get. And you're going to be seeing actual patients with actual diseases and they're going to count on you. And, um, you know, you don't want to be that physician that the nurses look at and think, oh no, we're going to have all these problems now. <laughs> this doctor's coming back into the hospital for the first time in six months. Um, don't be that person. Uh, so just take it seriously. Um, devote yourself fully to the clinical part of your training. And that's hard. I was one of the people who thought like, that sounds ridiculous. That's not what I'm here for. Like I signed up to do, you know, science in, in medicine. But why am I not doing science anymore? Um, but just I think you have to trust the people who've gone before you and who have done incredible uh, science and who are amazing clinicians uh, and to see that it actually works, so. Um, I will say um, we, so as far as like what's life like as a resident, it's great. I mean, it's really a fantastic and interesting time. You get to, like Mark said, you get to become a, like a clinician a, you get to learn clinical medicine um at university of colorado and a, a bunch of other programs i think pittsburgh and mayo and now university of washington i believe is changing to this model we do a 4-4 system where you have a month inpatient a month outpatient or elective time during the elective time you get your weekends and during your clinic time which is like every third month or fourth month or something they actually give you time to do research. Um, and in addition to just doing your outpatient clinic, so you manage your panel of outpatients, which is really, you don't need more than three, four half days a week to do. And then the rest of the time, really, they give you time to do research uh, or other things that you wanna do. And so um, I think that's been nice for me. I don't think that that's detracted away from my ability to be a good clinician. Um, I think if anything, it's like given me a taste of what it's like to be a physician scientist because I'm able to practice a little bit those skills of balancing very minimal projects as alongside my clinical duties. Um, and you know, when you're on those inpatient blocks, you're really on those inpatient blocks. Um, but you know that you have that breather coming in a, in four weeks or whatever. Um, and so it's been nice because I've had time to be able to meet with other, with faculty to try to figure out what lab I'm going to go into to get started on writing a few small grants and review papers, um, and to also do those activities alongside my co-residents, because it's not just something that's for me as a PSDB, it's something for our entire residency program. And so a lot of my co-residents and I now are working on research projects together. And a lot of those people weren't people that necessarily thought they wanted to do research, but they, you know, it's like something we can work on. So, so that was a consideration for me too, but I don't want to come across that you shouldn't very much dedicate these two years and probably the first year, year and a half of your fellowship to really entrenching yourself in clinical medicine and maybe learning more about clinical research if that's uh, not something you're exposed to during your research time in, in uh, medical school. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I just want to echo that, you know, this is your time to, to be a great clinician. You may see some of your non-physician scientist pathway or, you know, track um, colleagues trying to get involved in research, doing something clinical or things like that. Like I felt bad starting residency and my friends were already on research projects and everything. And but you've like done the work to already be selected for this pathway. You're not here to prove yourself. 
you know, they're, they are trying to make up for things that they didn't have the opportunity maybe to do before. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're living the life of any other resident for the most part. Um, our program, I don't know if you guys have any other like dedicated time at all, but we have, we work in like two week blocks. Um, and so every August, all of our physician scientist track folks have the same block off together. And basically we have time in the morning to like do chalk talks and tell each other about our research. And then we have the afternoons off to think about research or just to like recover and let our minds rest or you know, if we are involved in research projects or to talk about, like, meet up with potential research mentors, finish up stuff from our PhD, whatever the heck we want to do, um, we do have some of that dedicated time. Um, they just started, like, a retreat for us this year to start thinking about, like, the transition between different phases of our career. Um, but the main intention of it is to give us some free time to be able to fit that in um, and doing it at the same time as our other physician scientist colleagues. Um, and then a cool new thing that we're doing this year, actually, is that they're giving us a protected weekend so we can make it to the APSA meeting. So that's a pretty exciting thing for, for me, at least. So, um, yeah, so I'd say for the most part, the same as everyone else, except for we have a little bit of dedicated time to, to form community and do whatever we need to do from a physician scientist standpoint. I like that's that awesome. idea, and I'm going to try to get that started at our program, too. Yeah, we were thrilled um, we to hear have, that this year as well. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Um, we also have like specific programming built in throughout the year. Uh, the academic year hasn't started yet and I'm just starting out. So I don't know this uh, very specifically, but um, within the like noon conferences and academic time of residence, we have some specific uh, time dedicated to the PSTPs for basic science and other like research skills building. But it's different at every institution, and I think there's a lot of great, a lot of great programs at, at each program. Awesome. Um, getting back a little bit to the application process, um, what do you guys think the most important components of the application are for PSTP or research and residency applicants, and how is this similar to or different from application uh, applicants to categorical programs? Um, what do you think your program directors are looking for in applicants they invite for interviews and then in the applicants they end up ultimately ranking um, at the end of the process? Um, yeah, I think uh, um, I know I saw the the question in the chat asking about whether or not honors uh, not having honors is a is a red flag. Um, I don't know about a red flag. Um, but I do think that they these programs consider your clinical performance uh, very seriously, knowing that you will have a truncated clinical training. Um, and so they want to make sure that uh, you're able to um, uh, handle the the demands of the clinical training. And so as long as you can demonstrate that in, in some form or fashion, uh, even if it's not in getting the box ticked for honors, um, but uh, strong letters of rec or um, good comments in your dean's letter, uh, things like that, I think go a long way. Um, and one of the the positives for, and I'm I'm sorry, I know there's there's a lot of folks out there that are probably MD uh, and haven't done a PhD. Um, I guess more generally, you could say folks that have taken additional time to do research. Uh, tend to have had longer to have built uh, a resume full of things. And so um, it's knowing that, for example, with the PhD where you have four additional years, that's twice as long to fill your resume full of new material. Um, and so uh, any pet projects or hobbies or committees or um, things like that, I think uh, they're not no one is is that particularly important, but the fact that, you know, you've been active uh, or semi, you know, had periods of activity throughout those years um, really stacks up in a big way. Yeah, I think another thing that can maybe help you stand out is just being able to show the programs something very specific that you're like interested in the program in, like like, oh, I want to go there because it's good clinical training. Like, I want to go there because they have these researchers who are, you know, potential research mentors for me. Um, I included that in every single personal statement, whether it was like my top program or my last program. And that like, I got feedback on my like, 
interviews that that helped show from the start that I like had done the research on the program and I wasn't just like generally applying um even if there wasn't a lot of people who were super good of fit for research for me when I was like trying to geographically get myself located so I was applying to a few extra programs in the in the area um so I think you know being specific having a bit of a vision that you can maybe add in to say, especially from like a research thing, you don't need to say exactly, I want to study like this protein and whatever the heck, but like kind of being able to say like, I fit this program because of this. Um, I think we have a little bit of an added benefit um, in that way um, than perhaps our other um, applicants who aren't on the research sort of track. Yeah, um, I'll just add a, a couple of thoughts uh, based on the questions and the conversations that happen during interviews, because really, I, I've not been sitting on any admissions boards. I can't really tell you the uh, internal conversations that are happening there. But uh, a lot of the things that were commented on most frequently uh, had nothing to do <laughs> with my academics, with a lot of my hobbies and things. Um, and also, kind of apart from my research, uh, a lot of things that I got involved in and in, in, uh, during my MD PhD was education, like medical education related. Um, and I think what I began to realize as I was interviewing it, is that these programs aren't just looking for trainees, they're looking for junior faculty. Because if you're at a PSTP, that is sort of the expectation is that you're going to be developed into somebody they're going to hire uh, that will be a faculty at that same institution. Uh, and that's good for you, right? Because that kind of gives you uh, a job almost guaranteed, uh, assuming <laughs> that something kind of stock doesn't happen. But you have to start thinking, well, what in their minds makes for a good faculty at this institution? Medical education, research, you know, the, 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 the tier, right? We all know kind of what makes for a good faculty position. So try to try to think about that in your applications, like how am I meeting those or how, how can I address those interests by the institution? Uh, in some way in my application. Awesome, we have a couple kind of logistical questions. If any of you guys um, can speak to these things or know co-residents that have, um, can you talk about programs sponsoring visas? Um, for example, H-1B visas um, about applying as an IMG um, and kind of in a similar category of logistical match things about potentially couples matching in PSTPs. Um, so I can't speak uh, to being an I IMG or uh, needing a visa, but, but I can say that uh, at the program that I'm at, there's um, at least, I believe, three of our uh, eight PSTP uh, folks are international medical graduates. One of them actually uh, just arrived and is starting uh, orientation this week uh, because he's had uh, visa trouble um, because he went home uh, and then they couldn't renew his visa in time. And so there are ways to do it, but of course, um, funding, uh, be aware of the requirements of the funding uh, that comes along with the program uh, because those I know uh, frequently require um, citizenship and uh, things of that nature. So, um, but I know that there's a lot of, of successful IMG and, and visa applicants um, in amongst. Uh... Yeah, I think that's that's true. And I'm sorry, if, is anyone in the panel an, an IMG? Because I'll shut up if that's the case. <laughs> okay, because uh, we also had three uh, IMGs, and I'm very close friends with them. They're also kind of physician scientists aspiring as well. Um, one of them had a difficult time with their visa and actually had to start like four months after officially the the residency had started. Uh, and so just know that that is a problem, and it's not the end of the world if it happens. Um, try to get everything ready before it starts, but. Um, you won't lose an entire year if, if things do go wrong uh, on the government side, not yours. Um, but one of the things to consider if you are applying right now as an IMG, from what I've been told by uh, these three individuals, is that it, it helps you a ton. Uh, if not, it's required to you for you to have done some form of clinical exposure or experience in the United States. 
uh, and or also having done a lot of research in the United States. So it just kind of matters to sort of prove not just your interest, but like your ability to kind of operate in the system uh, to have spent some time at any institution in, in, in the US. So that would be just kind of one thing to think about. And then to add about kind of funding, maybe a little bit further down the line, often I like some NIH grants um, don't won't fund if you're like international or you have to have like a green card or things. Again, not once. I don't know the specifics on this, but I definitely know that's been mentioned. So um, like in fellowship, often there's T32 funding mechanisms during your, your research years. And then like if you're continuing the academic route, certain K awards and things like that. So I would just kind of look into those if they if that might be either a barrier or just more of a challenge of you know asking the programs how they would provide you funding during um, the the research years associated with like your fellowship or things would just be an important thing to figure out. Awesome. Okay, I think a really good question that was asked in the chat. Um, how common is it in the people that graduate from your programs to need to do a postdoc or an instructor period after finishing um, the PSTP? Um, does that feel inevitable or do you see people graduating from your programs that are able to kind of hit the ground running with a faculty, like a full faculty position immediately after they finish training? So, uh, so our program is like relatively young, so it's kind of tough. Um, and I think that's probably the case for, uh, you know, a majority of PSTPs in the country with, with some like seriously notable exceptions. But um, the people that I've known who've gone through the PSTP have all been hired as assistant professor here um, and have stayed and have done well. Um, some uh, people have gone through this process before there was a formal PSTP, but they fast tracked and they did all of their like research track stuff. Um, and those folks immediately got hired as assistant professor and have their own labs now. Um, I think the thing that I was thinking about, and I think it's been said here before, is that you've got to think about, are you going to be a, you know, you're, you're almost interviewing for uh, junior faculty position when you interview for these things. And that is from the people I've talked to, the hardest transition is not, is not from, believe it or not, PhD to M3, although that seems like an insurmountable bar to be, you know, for there to be anything worse than that. But, um, uh, but to go from a fellow to a assistant professor, instructor, whatever, but, um, to, to be able to build enough of a research infrastructure around you and separate yourself enough from your mentor and get enough funding so that you are independently driving your own research is the hardest period. And a lot of these programs, I think most notably uh, was Vanderbilt when I interviewed, but I think a lot of the really good PSTPs out there have mechanisms that support junior faculty as you're making that transition. And some of them even guarantee that they will um, hire you on. I think UNC guaranteed that they would hire you on as um, faculty. So uh, as far as I know, most people have done well. And in fact, most of the people from other PSTPs that I've talked to have, have been able to make that jump if they wanted to make that jump relatively easily. Within the Harvard system, at least, um, apparently everyone does a long instructor period after their or their postdoc, um, which is a fun thing. Um, but even within that, I think there's kind of a spectrum a little bit based on like the, the research area that you're in. So like the folks going into oncology because funding within NCI is like so ridiculously hard to get funded. Um, they typically have to spend a lot more time getting prelim data, doing stuff during their their postdoc phase in order to actually get a K and make themselves like a faculty candidate um, for the job hunt um, versus other folks who maybe are in like are going to be applying for grants in a different part of the NIH with better funding lines um, don't have to spend as much time during that. But at least even within our program, um, there's there's a lot of variation between those. 
Um, and something that I heard a lot of when I was interviewing um, was that a lot of times K awards are now now requiring a resubmission. And so that will frequently take people into uh, after out of outside of the, the full length of their training program. Um, and so uh, the the savvy term to ask about that is you can ask, you know, what mechanisms your program has for bridge funding. Um, and uh, specifically at, at uh, a lot of the programs that we interviewed at or that I interviewed at, um, they had uh, specific things they could point to, um, which were very reassuring. Um, and uh, I know at, at uh, Yale specifically, I think it, it's not uncommon to need to take uh, an additional year or two um, to uh, really lock in the funding. Because even if you get notice of award, it's a while before that funding get, comes on board. And so there's uh, a path for that. So, sorry, I'll just say one last thing. Um, I agree to, with what has been said. I'll just kind of emphasize though that this PSTP requires a two to three year postdoc. So that's inevitable. You have to do that if you're short tracking. Yeah, that's unavoidable. Uh, the, the question uh, that was posed to me when I was asking about this uh, while interviewing at Brigham and then at MGH was, why do you want to do junior faculty so quickly? Uh, <laughs> and the reason for them asking was that Frankly, do you feel like you're ready day one after finishing fellowship to be on the tenure clock? Because that's really the question you're having to ask is that, you know, you're going to have startup funds, you're going to have to be getting ROR grants or some very large form of funding for your own lab and, and the people inside of it. Um, do you feel like you're ready to do that? Because if so, apply and, and frankly, you can probably get it somewhere uh, if you're ready for it. But most people probably aren't and could kind of use a bit of a runway, uh, which, you know, it, <laughs> the Harvard system we call an instructor position uh, to be able to get to that position uh, of then applying for and getting tenure somewhere. Uh, if I could just address a couple of points real quickly. One is, I agree, there is a, there is baked in research time that's necessary in your fellowship that you have to complete as part of ABIM. The exception to that is if you get a K grant funded, uh, they have to hire you on as an assistant professor uh, when that grant is able to come on board. Um, and divisions are very happy to do that because you're bringing in money now to the division. Um, and I agree that your um, that you know the question is, are you ready to be faculty? Um, is gonna be a different answer for everybody. Um, and some people probably won't feel like they're absolutely ready. And I think the instructor position is an okay way to do that. But I think uh, there are mechanisms by which you can be an assistant professor in uh, medicine in a division that's supportive um, to uh, allow you enough time to get to, um, you know, fac like get your, uh, tenure clock on time, right? It, it depends on whether or not your division is supportive. And that sort of plays to the other problem that we're having with physician scientists, which is this extreme extension of the amount of time we're spending in training. We do four years of undergrad, we do an eight year plus PH, MD, PhD, then we do residency and fellowship. And there are, at some juncture, we have to like push and start that career. And I I think for every person that's gonna be different, but I, I, I think that we shouldn't be afraid of making that leap as physician scientists, because nine times out of 10, the, the division's going to promote you because they uh, believe in whatever the cause of physician scientists broadly. And that's gonna vary from institution to institution. But I think I would caution us against being fearful of the tenure clock in the same way some of our colleagues that are PhD alone uh, uh, kind of fear that tenure clock. Awesome. In our last couple of minutes, um, just want to give each of you kind of a parting shot. If you have any um, kind of final words of wisdom or, or what would your single best piece of advice for aspiring um, research track residents um, or future physician scientists um, be?
Um, I'll start. Right then. Oh, <laughs> sorry, please. Oh. Here, you can. Um, I was going to just say, we talk all the time about this, like the years and, you know, the number of the, num the amount of time that takes to get us like where we want to go. Right. I would say, don't get bogged down by the years. The years are, are fun. They're all different. And it's all the process of you training and learning what you have to do to be able to run a lab and, and be a physician. So there's so much to learn. You acquire knowledge at an amazing rate during this time. And so just take it one step at a time and, um, you know, don't let the number of years prevent you from doing what you love. If you really love being able to treat patients and, um, use what you know and, and go into the lab and try to solve problems for them. It's very rewarding. And, uh, the time goes fast and you just get to learn so much. So that's my one piece of advice. Um, there were, I don't, this won't be advice necessarily, just more thoughts. Um, one of which is, I just want to assuage any fears out there that, um, I applied without published manuscripts. I had two preprints. Um, I was co-author on a few, um, but my big PhD dissertation research was still a preprint when I applied. Um, it was submitted. And so that's a hurdle to try to make, uh, before, um, before you apply. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I definitely, again, thinking about the years, you can't put life on hold during these programs. So I, uh, I would strongly recommend if this, you know, I would, I would try to start your life and whatever that means to you. For me, that was considering, uh, salary, uh, benefits, um, you know, whether or not there's a retirement associated with your program, whether or not they cover your health insurance, your health insurance for your dependents, whether uh, they uh, whether there's affordable housing, whether you can buy a house. Um, if those are things that are um, that are uh, obviously those are important to everybody. But um, I guess weighing those against uh, the opportunity of being at, um, you know, a different institution. So. Those are things to consider. I can go next then. <clears throat> um, yeah, I guess the one piece of advice that I would say, in, in addition to what has already been mentioned, which is fantastic, is don't, or and maybe stop asking what the programs are looking for, what they want. I really want to encourage you guys to think carefully and try to focus on what do you want. What like, what are you actually looking for in a program? What are you looking for in a career? What excites you about, you know, what lies ahead? Uh, and try to answer that question well, because that's what the programs are also trying to answer uh, when they meet you. Um, so just tr really think about that. Try to graduate from the mentality of like, how am I going to be competitive in their eyes? and Things like that, because that just stops mattering at this point. Um, in a related sense, um, and this applies to any stage in our training, don't let anyone tell you what your goals should be. Uh, you need to have those clearly outlined and don't look to a program to tell you kind of what is important to you, what's valuable. Uh, those would be kind of the things I try to reinforce to you guys. You basically took what I was going to say. Um <laughs> But yeah, once you get that interview, you are just as much interviewing them. You know, you, you've you made it, you you got that, um, and you deserve to be there. Um, and really, what, what you need to do is find the best program for you. They may not be the quote unquote, best programs, but it's everyone has different personal sort of things, um, kind of tying into what everyone else said. Um, you know, there's a number of different factors to consider. And this is you know, every time that you have a transition, it's a time to think about what you want. And there's always opportunity to reevaluate and, and change your mind. Um, but it's a really, you know, good opportunity to find the best place for you. And thank you. All. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I'll be brief. I just want to say, like, I can't see any of the obviously, because it's still a webinar, and I'm technologically almost illiterate. But um I know that whoever's listening to this, it's, you know, 
seven, eight o'clock on the East Coast um, on a Thursday night, and you're here wanting to learn about PSTPs. And so if I can say one thing, it is don't exactly what Mark and Hannah have just said, which is you are the people that we need as physician scientists. Like we need you in this workforce. If you're here and you're interested in this, don't let any sort of intimidation or, or imposter syndrome or anything uh, drive you away from a career as a physician scientist, if that's what you want. The world needs people like you and um, physician scientist training programs want people like you. And so I, I certainly, I think my uh, contact information is probably somewhere on here, but if there's anything I can do, and I'm sure any, anyone else on the panel can do to help with applications or um, uh, talking through interviews or figuring out more about the process, uh, we are more than happy to because we are a very small community and we have to have each other's backs and support each other and nurture each other because this is a hard long road and without that community that I think has come up over and over and over again tonight it's an impossible road to travel. Awesome that is so much wisdom and good advice for all of us no matter what stage of our training we're at. Um, thank you all for joining us for our Q&A session today. Um, with the current PSTP residents. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to our panelists for your time. Um, we know that residency is very busy and you're often short on sleep, so we really appreciate you spending um, an hour or so of your time with us tonight. Um, I also want to thank everyone who attended, as well as the various APSA um, committees that make this possible. Of course, our virtual content committee who takes the lead in these sessions, as well as the supporting committees, um, including our um, diversity, Justice, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Committee, our PR Committee, um, Partnerships Committee, and the rest of the APSA leadership. Um, and I want to tell everyone that our next PSTP interactive session is scheduled for September 14th, and that'll actually be focused on opportunities in pediatrics. Um, I'll post in the information um, to register in the chat, and so please be sure to share that um, with your friends or um, anyone that you know that's interested in training in a research-oriented pediatrics program. Um, stay tuned for, via social media for our future PSTP events as well. We'll um, be holding um, a residency um, program directors panel, as well as some specific sessions on interviews, um, selecting a program, and then eventually in the spring, we'll also have a session um, on with recently matched applicants on kind of a reflection of their experience in the application process. Um, so thank you again to all of our panelists and have a great night.